Hello everyone, this is Emma Ning from the University of Illinois Chicago presenting our teamwork on smartphone dynamics and brain health. Brain health includes many general domains. To measure general cognition, we might think of typical response time measurements as an index of how fast an individual is processing information. Brain health can also be reflected through motor domains, such as the execution of voluntary movement. In addition to these two domains, an individual's behaviors, lifestyle, or stress level can all affect their brain health. But the question is, why is measuring individual behaviors that relate to brain health important? Imagine you're an individual who lives with debilitating mental health conditions and need to meet with clinicians or psychiatrists. For you, clinical visits are infrequent and expensive and oftentimes inaccessible. Even after paying and finally finding an appointment time that works for your schedule, you're stressed going to a doctor's office. You have to think about getting there on time and how you want to present yourself. And after some waiting, you finally meet with a clinician who asks you to recall how you have been doing for the last two weeks. They ask you to rate many items on a scale. You're unsure whether you're recalling your feelings accurately. On top of that, you're not sure whether you're good at detecting or labeling your feelings at all. So you give the clinician a few ratings and hope that they have your previous medical records pulled up underneath their standard assessments. As a result, as a better alternative, ecological momentary assessments took advantage of the prevalence of smartphones and sent users multiple surveys to complete in a given day. For these surveys or assessments, the user may be asked to rate their feelings and some other additional items. They may also be asked to complete a few active tasks, such as the trail-making test, which measures executive functioning, visual attention, and set switching. But are there other potentially more unobtrusive ways to measure mood and cognition? Dr. Alex Liao, the principal investigator of the project, is a pianist herself. She noticed when she was playing the piano when she was tired or distracted, she was more likely to play out of tempo and make errors. She then wondered, could this be true of a phone keyboard? If people are tired, distracted, when using their phone, would they make more typos, type slower, etc.? To transfer this inspiration from the piano keyboard to the smartphone keyboard, our team created the Biaffect app to see whether fluctuations in a person's typing behavior reflect something about their mood and cognition. What you're looking at is the Biaffect keyboard. After downloading the Biaffect app, it replaces the native iPhone keyboard with a cosmetically similar keyboard. The video shows someone typing using the Biaffect keyboard. The keyboard only records typing metadata, such as timing information, and never the content a user types. In addition to timing information, the activation of the keyboard also triggers accelerometer data during the keyboard session. Panel B is an example of a typical typing session. The X represents key press number and Y represents typing speed, which is the time lapse between consecutive keys. So the higher up a point is on Y, the slower their typing is. At the beginning of the session, the user is typing fast and consistent. This continues until they hit an error, as can be seen by the character backspace transition. They paused a bit, then hit the backspace multiple times, possibly deleting the entire word. They then took an even longer pause, perhaps to think about how to rephrase the word, and then kept on typing. What I showed in panel B is represented by a dot in panel C. The size of the dot represents how long or how many key presses are within a session. The X is time of day and Y is day number. Panel C shows two example users, user A on the left and user B on the right. We, if we ask users to use the Biaffect keyboard as their main keyboard, we can see what time they interact with their keyboard the most throughout the day. Not only that, we can see if they're consistently using the keyboard within a fixed time window across days. For example, user A on the left shows a consistent absence of keyboard interaction for about six hours, whereas user B on the right does not, potentially indicating sleep interruptions where they get up to type on their phone. So that led us to ask the question, is it feasible to describe individuals' intraday behavior using keystroke and accelerometer data? And if so, can we explain differences in people's intraday behavior? Specifically, intraday or diurnal fluctuations 
refer to behavioral rhythms synchronized with day and night cycle with a period of 24 hours. It has been shown that humans show diurnal fluctuations in alertness and overall cognitive functioning. So our attempt here is to explore whether unobtrusively captured keyboard and accelerometer data show diurnal patterns. In addition to using unobtrusively captured keyboard and accelerometer data, we also included the results from the digital trail making test, a reliable active task that measures executive functioning, visual attention, and set switching into our analysis. To answer our question, participants used the bi-affect keyboard for approximately 28 days. They came into the clinic three times, and their cognition was assessed using the digital trail making test at each clinical visit. Visits are scheduled to be 14 days apart. Our sample consists of 85 individuals, 60 of which are individuals with mood disorder, and that probably includes major depressive disorder and bipolar type 1 and 2. There was no difference in age between the healthy control and the mood disorder group. Within each group, the gender split was approximately 50-50. In, in the analysis I present next, we analyzed over 74,000 keyboard sessions using mixed effects models. Here I am showing the intraday fluctuations in key press data. On the x-axis is time of day, and on the y-axis is typing speed. The higher you go on the y-axis, the slower the typing speed. The lighter shade of gray represents individuals who did worse on the digital trail making test, as measured by the digital trail making test on the app. The darker shade of gray represents individuals who did better. As we can see across the two curves, both curves show concave up U-shaped patterns. This indicates that overall, everyone typed faster in the afternoons and evenings, and their typing speed slowed down as they go into the nights. This is consistent with literature suggesting a sundowning effect, where people's processing speed slows down towards the end of the day, and that perhaps is telling us that we should not be typing up our emails at night. In addition to this, we see that individuals who performed worse on the digital trail making also slow down significantly more in their typing speed as they go into the night, suggesting a more dramatic sundowning effect. Here, I am showing the intraday fluctuations in accelerometer data. On the x-axis is time of day, and on the y-axis is overall motor activity captured by the accelerometer during the keyboard sessions. Specifically, y represents the percentage of accelerometer samples that show accelerations within each typing session. Both curves are concave down, suggesting that overall, individuals moved more during keyboard sessions in the mornings and afternoons. The amount of movements decreased as the day went. In addition to this, we see that there are diurnal motion pattern differences. Specifically, individuals who performed better on the digital trail making test showed a more pronounced diurnal motion pattern than those who performed worse on the digital trail making test. This suggests that this difference can be partly explained by cognition. It can also potentially point toward self-regulatory behaviors and or sleep hygiene habits that promote cognition. To summarize, our study jointly modeled keyboard dynamics and accelerometer data. In doing this, we tested and estimated effect sizes for granular temporal changes that are in turn explained by cognition. In the future, we hope to build onto the current study and use granular session level information to build digital fingerprints for each individual, eventually leading to individualized monitoring and prediction. Finally. I want to thank all the funding agencies and our cross-disciplinary collaborative team behind BiAffect, without whom the work I present today would not be possible. It is also my great honor and pleasure to present our findings at CHI 2023, and I look forward to engaging in further discussions with a knowledgeable audience here. Thank you.